Hello, and welcome to another episode of Rational Actors on Blogging Heads. I'm Kevin Glass, Managing Editor at Town Hall, and today I'm joined by... I'm Mike Grunwald. I'm a Senior National Correspondent for Time Magazine, and I wrote The New New Deal, The Hidden Story of Change in the Obama Era. Yeah, so thanks for coming on with me, Mike. Um, what I wanted to discuss today is there was a New York Times article uh, out earlier in the week that had a bunch of quotes from Democrats on the Hill, both named and anonymous, about President Obama's kind of subpar reputation as a as someone who leads legislation on Capitol Hill. And I wanted to get your take on this because it, your book, The New New Deal, is, uh, is a story of uh, one of his biggest, if not his biggest, legislative accomplishments. Um, so I know this story has popped up a couple times, and I find it interesting. I know a lot of other people find it tiresome, and I wanted to kind of get your perspective on the Obama administration's ability to negotiate through the kind of corridors of power on Capitol Hill, and whether these Democrats' complaints are substantive, or even if they are, do they matter that much? Well, it's a, it's a great topic. It's certainly one that, uh, you know, it's kind of close to my heart. Um, I should start. So there is this, there's this kind of meme out there that Obama is aloof. He doesn't really like politics. He doesn't like Congress. He doesn't like talking to these kind of, you know, grasping, glad handing guys, you know, who spend all their lives trying to get elected. And it's basically right. Right. Um, you know, I can't really uh, I can't really defend him and pretend that he actually, you know, the White House is putting out these numbers like, oh, no, we've uh, we've made many a lot of outreach to Congress and we've made this many calls and this many contacts. But it's basically bogus. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if if, uh, if you disagree, but my sense is that he hates playing the game. Um, and uh, I think as a politician, you could call that a character flaw. Um, it's not one that I. You know, I kind of relate to it because, you know, who, I don't really think very highly of Congress either. And I can see why it would be annoying to deal with those guys. Um, but I think it's a fair, it's a fair criticism that he, uh, that he doesn't like doing it and that he, um, avoids doing it. Uh, I, the question I think is whether it really matters. And that's where, uh, I would say the evidence is overwhelming that it, it doesn't matter much. Yeah, I would, mo I would agree. I don't think that, I think that Obama does, uh, kind of disdain the, the, the politicking, the, I have to have a face to face meeting with this person and kind of, uh, subjugate myself to them to ask them for their votes or whatever. Um, I think that he doesn't like that. And, uh, his record is, is pretty clear on that. I think that, um, I'm, we'll get to the if it matters question in a moment. But I think that something that Claire McCaskill actually said to the New York Times in this article, which is that he has a disdain for Congress uh, that is shared by most people in America. And that's absolutely true. Congress has a dismal approval rating. And this kind of petty bickering that we see on the Hill um, is one of those big reasons why. Uh, and I wrote about this kind of a pseudo response to that New York Times article that look, politicians themselves, they're kind of by, I don't, I don't know if it's by the nature of the job, but it's definitely by the ma nature of how our modern political system is set up. They're petty people. This is an overgeneralization and there are good politicians out there who I like on a personal level, but they're petty people. They're, they're egotistical people. They're, dr they're driven and power hungry and all of that. And they're relentless kind of ladder climbers. And that's almost what you have to be to get to the level of um, a nationally important congressman or a senator or something like that. You have kind of by and large, they have these character traits. So when, a, 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 let's say, a sitting senator might perceive some kind of slight from the Obama administration who, you know, are the center of power in Washington, uh, they're g they might take it to the media and say, oh, he hurt my feelings. I don't like that. Um, and I... Whether it matters, um, I'm not sure, but it certainly seems to be the case. And like you said, we've seen this this meme, this narrative throughout the Obama administration that he's aloof. He doesn't particular. He finds you know this this petty 
politics of politicking beneath him. Um, he try he likes to keep his hands clean. He considers himself to be above the fray of these, like I said, petty and egotistical people over on Capitol Hill. Um, so I do think it, it's certainly, you know, President Obama had this promise to come to change Washington, right? I'm not sure that he's changed Washington, but he certainly acts like he doesn't want to get involved in the pettiness that we associate with Capitol Hill. Um, and the what I think, um, I'm not sure that that makes it better or worse uh, on Capitol Hill. You know, I don't, it's certainly true that the characteristics of the people on the Hill haven't changed. That's right. And remember, he, you know, he was in, uh, you know, he served his short stint on Capitol Hill. I quoted Joe Biden in my book. He told me that, that the president's one said to him, look, you were a senator. I was never a senator. Um, Obama hated being in the Senate. You know, listen to all these gas bags, make these speeches for the cameras, um, you know, including gas bags like Joe Biden, right? There's this sort of famous moment where he passed a note uh, to one of his aides while Biden was making one of his, you know, pontifications that said, shoot me now. Um, he just didn't <laughs> like doing it. He, uh, he thought it was silly. Um, he didn't like the people. And now it's true. I, I saw in that Times article, they said he's played, what, like a hundred rounds of golf and he's only invited one senator to, to play with him. Right. Um, this was <laughs> this was supposed to be very damning. But I have to admit, I, I, I find it kind of a, a winning trait that uh, that he doesn't like hanging out with these people and he doesn't really pretend and he's not wasting his time threatening them or sucking up to them. Um, he sees his job as to kind of get stuff done. And uh, and when he says, you know, what, should I go have a drink with Mitch McConnell? Um, what's that going to do? I think that's that's basically correct. Right. Uh, and actually, um, Ezra Klein at Vox had a piece yesterday, yesterday or two days ago, kind of saying that, yeah, it doesn't matter. And that in, in discussions that he's had, nobody would say that, uh, you know, a couple more meetings with President Obama or a golf trip or something like that would change their votes on anything. Um, and that's right. probably largely true. You know, it's not the case that uh, anything, probably nothing that President Obama could have tried to do would have passed uh, the gun background checks legislation that he was pushing uh, last year. You know, the Republicans were incredibly unified on that. Um, and that's one of their kind of core principles that they're not going to compromise on. But, That's right. And um, on the other hand, I would say that no legislator is going to admit to anyone that a round of golf is going to change their vote on something. But it might be the case that it would. You know, they're not going to admit that because, again, that would make them come off as petty and egotistical. And like, you know, a cup of coffee at Caribou Coffee across the street from the White House, would it cause them to compromise a core principle? Um, so I kind of looked at it and there are a couple you know, maybe relatively small bore issues, but issues out there where it seems like President Obama's inability to curry favor with the Democratic caucus uh, might have gotten a couple things done. And I raised uh, the issue of there was some trade legislation earlier this year that, you know, Republicans were all on board with. Uh, the White House was pushing um, a lot of Democratic leadership in both the House and Senate was pushing it, but a smaller, very uh, vocal group of Democrats was uh, pretty heavily against it. Um, now I'm not sure again that, uh, right. some, some coffee or some golf would have changed anyone's vote on, uh, trade legislation because again, that's a pretty closely held value of a lot of Democrats on Capitol Hill. But it does seem like, uh, there, there are places where, uh, a better working relationship that the White House could have on Capitol Hill with some of those leg legislators might have made a difference. Well, let me, uh, I think the counter argument is to look at, at the Obama record. And to there, you know, I should come out clean and say that my take on Obama is that he's, he has a pretty extraordinary record of achievement, whether you like what he's achieved or not. Um, and, uh, and the main things he achieved, um, to take them one by one, the first thing is, this is what I wrote my book about, was this, this $800 billion stimulus bill that, in my, it's, it, rescued an economy that was hemorrhaging 800,000 jobs a year. It also launched a clean energy revolution. It digitized our medical records, incredible investments in research and, and, uh, and infrastructure and you name it. 
Um, that, uh, you know, he, he passed that, the, you know, at that time there was a Democratic caucus with 58 members and they ranged from the loony left, um, the, uh, you know, the, the Bernie Sanders and, you know, the, the Sherrod Browns and Barbara Boxers, um, to some really very conservative red state Democrats, the Ben Nelsons and Evan Byes, uh, Joe Lieberman, um, who at that point wasn't even a, a Democrat anymore. Um, and they all supported him. Move on to Obamacare, right? This is the, the dream of the Democratic Party since, uh, since the Roosevelt era, um, even more controversial. And once again, uh, the, they at least got three Republicans to support the, support the stimulus. Zero Republicans supported Obamacare. And once again, this time there were now 60 Democrats, including uh, one former, former Republican, Arlen Specter, and he got all 60 of them which was really a kind of remarkable thing. Um, move on to financial reform. And there, there was, uh, this was the only time he lost a, a Democrat on a, on a major vote. Um, Russ Feingold from the sort of prissy caucus um, opposed it because he didn't think it was, it was left enough. But, you know, that's, those are three extraordinarily comprehensive, sweeping pieces of legislation that are going to be remembered for a very long time. And... These Democrats who he did not take out to coffee and he did not play golf with and whose asses he did not kiss, um, they all went along with him. Um, it represents part of what Ezra said about, uh, about you know, the kind of polarization of, of the country and that Democrats sort of have nowhere else to go, something that Obama certainly recognizes. But also, I would say, recognizes that, it, that his... His agenda that he ran on in 2008 and was very popular at the time of, you know, reforming health care and uh, reforming the, the way we use energy in this country and, you know, sort of reducing taxes for the middle class and raising them on the rich. Um, it, it ended up, it was pretty popular in the Democratic caucus all across that, those diverse political and ideological positions, um, and they all went along with him. Um, and so... It's, it's hard to see, you know, on the Republican side, I, I wrote about in the book how even in December and January before Obama took office, there was really this kind of relentless strategy of obstructionism that was not going to, you know, react too well to uh, a little bit of ass kissing either. Um, it's hard to see really um, in the legislative arena to the extent he's been able to get things done. It's hard to see, you know, what he failed to do where that a little bit more tenderness could have uh, could have made a big difference. Right, I I wholeheartedly agree that uh, he passed you know monumental legislation and largely the legislation that he promised he would get passed, which is uh, unlike a lot of politicians. You know, he ran on a on a platform and passed, like you said, legislation that's going to be remembered for a very very long time. Um, he got the big things done. And in, in, in light of that, it's hard to fault his, in I mean, the, the, the accused inability to get some of the little things done. I wanted to ask you, um, so those things were all accomplished, um, in, I, I'm pretty sure here, in the first That's right. year or so of his presidency, right? First year two plus years. couple first two months. Years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, a, a criticism that I think that I've seen is that the Obama White House had a tougher time transitioning from uh, a supermajority era on Capitol Hill into an era of, you know, you might call it Republican obstructionism, and then post-2010, or 2010, um, Republicans actually being in control in the House. So um, do you see any merit to the criticism that the White House has been, has had a tougher time um, negotiate, I mean, so, I don't want, well, we might get into this, but there is powerful Republican opposition to the Obama uh, agenda. Do you think there is any way um, that the Obama administration could have better negotiated through the era in which uh, Republicans have a little more power on the Hill? Um, you know, one of the quotes that I thought was important from that New York Times article was, uh, Joe Manchin talked about uh, introspection being a good way for the Obama administration to maybe critique their own performance here. Um, do you think that at any level, the Obama administration's kind of post-Republican 
ascendancy on the hill uh, strategy has been suboptimal. Well, it's, I mean, this is one of those things where, uh, I mean, you can look at what he's done and say, like, there, there, he's done it. Now we're getting into the sort of world of counterfactual. Right. And I have to say that for me, it's very hard for me to figure out where it is that he could have gotten um, a lot of Republican support. And, of course, one of the real ironies here is a lot of these people who are making the complaint that he hasn't adjusted to this era of divided government are the same people who are saying, you know, he sort of isn't taking care and feeding his base, which, of course, the more he reaches out, right. as he tried to do with the grand bargain, um, uh, the kind of grand fiscal deal with Republicans, which he really did genuinely uh, pursue for, you know, some would say, uh, long past, it was clear that it wasn't going to happen. Um, ever, you know, to the extent he really did pursue it, he really was alienating a lot of liberals with things like chain CPI and um, you know potential Medicare cuts, things that yeah. things that liberals really didn't like. Now, ultimately, it didn't come to any, anything. And I would, I really would go back to uh, you know, like I wrote in my book, uh, you know, Republicans were very open with me. They told me about those meetings in December two thousand eight where. Eric Cantor brought his team together in the House and said, you know, the, you know I, I don't care if they're saying, yes, we can, yes, we can, out on the mall, um, we are going to fight this guy, where Mitch McConnell said the same thing to his caucus in January 09, that we have got to stick together, um, that opposition is our way back to the promised land. And, and again, they, <laughs> that worked very well for them in 2010. Um, they realized that opposition to Obama was really good politics, as McConnell put it, um, most Americans don't follow every jit and toddle of, of what's happening in, in, uh, in Washington. All they know is either there's kind of bipartisan agreement on reasonable stuff or else there's the same old partisan bickering. And after Obama had made all those big promises about how he was going to, you know, there's going to be post-partisan cooperation and we're going to bring people together in Washington, McConnell realized that just by saying no, he could turn Obama into a liar. And show that this was just the same old partisan bickering. Um, they've done a very good job at that. Um, it's really hard to see issues. You look at immigration, um, you look at gun control, where this kind of very modest stuff that Obama was pushing, I've seen polls where something like 80 or 90 percent of the public supports it, but the Republican Party does not. And if you're a Republican politician, there's really no percentage in trying to cut a deal with Obama. Now, you're probably representing a state or a district that is, you know, extremely anti-Obama. Um, and all you're doing is inviting a primary challenge. Um, mostly Obama has, you know, his, he's tried to keep his caucus together. He's gotten a lot of judges confirmed. He's, uh, you know, he's, he passed the big stuff in the first couple of years. He's avoided, a, you know, us from defaulting on our, on our debt, you know, that kind of catastrophe. And so we've been able to kind of keep rolling along. The economy's still growing. We haven't had the kind of economic cataclysm that you see in Europe. Um, but, you know, this really isn't a, a sort of very fertile moment for bipartisan legislation. And I'm not sure that a lot of good schmoozing would have made that a uh, different playing field. Yeah, I would. Yeah, definitely. I would say that the parties are, and this has been well documented in things about polarization and things like that. The parties are very far apart kind of in their median or average uh, legislator on Capitol Hill. So um, it is hard to get that compromise. And I think that you've talked about this uh, a little bit and I've seen it around. The The idea of kind of the, the centrist journalists in Washington that um, meritless compromise, that is compromise that uh, doesn't make any sense, uh, but compromise for the sake of compromise. Um, right. That that kind of and I, and I think we're seeing that play out right now. That that's nonsensical. You shouldn't be in favor of compromise uh, merely for the sake of compromise. Um, for example, and I think that the uh, Republican immigration bill is a really good example of this. We can say, um, and and I've seen this actually from some of the centrist journalists. You know, they say. Republicans need to compromise on immigration and pass immigration reform that's going to address uh, our current uh, child migrant crisis. And Republicans say, okay, here's legislation that addresses that. Um, and it 
the, then the compromised worshippers will say, that's not what you're supposed to do. That's the wrong legislation to address this. Even if the legislation is just deport, the d legislation is, um, would, re might result in a lot of deportations of, uh, these newly arrived immigrants. Um, and a lot of people don't want that, but it would quote unquote solve the problem. Um, so the idea of compromise for the sake of compromise or, or just like, or meritless compromise, uh, it, it, it's very, it's a very strong idea. And I know you're not in the DC area, but you, you certainly have this, uh, this bubble that you kind of watch from the outside. Um, but it is a, it is a very strong, uh, idea within the Washington bubble that there needs to be more compromise on Capitol Hill. Um, and I think both, um, Repu well, I won't say Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives are kind of united against this idea. Um, and, you know, the, the, the distance between the parties right now makes that kind of an idea without merit right now. Well, and this is, uh, and this is something where I think you're exactly right. The sort of Washington conventional wisdom, um, about the sort of that by definition compromise is good. Um, and that, and where it really puts pressure is that it, it jibes with this Washington narrative that the president is in charge. Um, as if sort of congressional elections don't have consequences too. Um, so it's sort of up to the president to compromise. So if there isn't a comp so compromise is good, that's part A. And part B, if there isn't a president, a compromise, it shows that the president isn't leading. Um, and when you have this, you know, this party that he's negotiating with that really does not have an interest on some of these issues, particularly the fiscal issues, like there's really no percentage in them to compromise with Obama. They they get nothing out of it. They, they're happy to let him own this partisan bickering. Um, and yet, if Obama's going to be blamed every time there's no compromise, that increases the uh, the you know. Then then why would they reach out to him? So Obama has to kind of reach out to them. They say no. Um, and the sort of you know we all know who we're talking about. The sort of Ron Fourniers of the world will just say well. It's true. The uh, the Republicans are sort of being obstructionist and uh, and intransigent, but it's up to Obama to reach out further to him, yeah. and uh, and that creates this sort of uh, this kind of vicious cycle where the you know it, the incentives are for Republicans to try to get Obama to negotiate against himself. Um, it's a uh, <laughs> it's it's not a very fruitful way to to look at the you know people have called it kind of green lanternism, but when we come back to to you know our topic, um, it just creates this very bad set of incentives that um, that sort of uh, chit chat is not going to change. Um, you know these are all elected politicians. I think a president of either party has an interest in trying to sort of bring everybody together and uh, and you know hold the bill bill signing with you know both both parties and in the rose garden um, because no matter what the bill is, that's going to make the president look good. Um, but any opposition is going to have, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a high bar to make it worth their while to do that. Yeah. Um, you've been covering politics for longer than I have, but I've seen, you know, the, the Lyndon Johnson mythology that makes me sad. Uh, is kind of very strong in Washington. And yeah. I think um, we're getting to the point of a myth almost a mythology around Bill Clinton as well, because, you know, his, his strategy of triangulation was... He would say, uh, you know, the the liberal Democrats in Congress are on this side, the Republicans in Congress are on this side, and I'm in the middle. Um, and that seems to be something that uh, some of the centrist Washington journalists want President Obama to do as well. He just, that they want him to just say, uh, you know, I'm not on this side, I'm not on this side, I'm above it all. I'm well, not above it all because that was that's the initial problem with our topic here. Uh, but that he's in the middle between them, that he's the the broker between, uh, we could say, the liberals and the, the conservatives in Congress. But, you know, it's a completely different era now. The, the parties were very different. Their median voter or their median legislator was much closer. Um, it, it might not make a whole lot of sense, um, both ideologically and pragmatically, to try and position, if you're the president, yourself in between the two parties. Um, I and, think... And, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, you, know, you go. I was just going to say, and in that great era of compromise, the president got impeached. 
Right, <laughs> um, right, 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 right. right. I, uh, and now you look at what's I, – I actually – I don't know if you've uh, seen it. I was up in New York, and I saw the one-man show with uh, the Breaking Bad guy, Brian Cranston, playing yeah. LBJ. Um, and it's it's a wonderful show. Um, he he did a fantastic job channeling LBJ. If you've read the Carol books, it's uh, it's really compelling. You know the physicality, the way he used to throw himself at these guys. You know, um, talk both sides of you know talk talk like a liberal to the liberal. Oh, I just you know I just got to make these you know these segregationists think I'm on their side. You know, tell the segregationists you know I'm one of you. I just got to make the the liberals think you know I just got to carry them along. Um, all kinds of things that uh, that would be outraged outrage today. And you look at the uh, the politicians who have done even the slightest bit of hardball politics. What's happening to them? You know, Andrew Cuomo, Rick Perry, Scott Walker. They're all under investigation, right, for playing politics. Yeah. Uh, these days, a, a president, a governor, less so a government, but particularly a president, they have very little to offer these guys and they have very little to threaten them with. Um, you know, I suppose Obama could have used you know, nice meetings at the White House as sort of a, uh, you know, kind of perk. But honestly, that doesn't real. I don't think it really plays with these with these guys when there's, you know, there's so much money. They spend so much time. They they don't hang out in Washington like they used to. They're they're flying home to their districts every second they can. Um, when they're not in, they're not hanging out in the cloakroom. They're on the phone dialing for dollars. Um, it really is a different era, um, and a president. Or any politician is really limited in the amount of, you know, goodwill they can they can get through schmoozing. It's sort of hard to blame them for for focusing for focusing on you know running the government, running foreign policy, um, trying to get the policy right, trying to keep their promises, and hoping that their team will will come along. Yeah, I think there's a potential alliance to be made, alliance critique to be made here uh, between non-mainstream journalists, and uh, actually some libertarians. And I want to bring up this book uh, called The Cult of the Presidency by Gene Healy, and um, he's of the Cato Institute, and he kind of lays out that um, the, the, the presidency has turned into this um, mythological, again, force in American politics, where uh, a lot of people kind of worship the office as having almost almighty power, and that's it's just simply not true. Uh, well, it shouldn't be true, and um, they kind of, but the mainstream press kind of looks to the Oval Office as uh, an unstoppable force that should be able to get its will done, and kind of this mythologizing about Lyndon Johnson, um, the mythologizing about Bill Clinton, uh, uh, as kind of these Washington power brokers that were able to kind of get stuff done in an era of divided government, uh, it's they're myths, like you said. You know, Bill Clinton was impeached by uh, a, a Republican minor, or well, they were. They just took uh, they con- took control of the House and then the Senate later. Um, that like it it it's just this this inability of the press to kind of try and focus their attention away from the Oval Office and into other corridors of power where uh, that's where the, A, deal-making may or may not occur, and B, uh, it would show kind of how difficult it actually is to, to grind the sausage in Washington nowadays. And that's they, right. They, and, they of think... course, the, uh, you know, the ultimate irony, right, is that there's this, you know, it's why won't the president lead? Why won't the president lead? Why can't he break through this gridlock? And then, of course, he, so he says, well, you know, there's gridlock. I'm going to start doing some of this stuff through executive action. And then they, you know, then it's like impeach or at least like, right. let's sue him. You know, how dare he? And then some of the same people are saying, why can't he lead? It's like, why is he so divisive? Um, why is he, why is he doing these, these actions that are, that are clearly just, you know, poking a stick at these Republicans? Um, it is a sort of, uh, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. The flip right. side, I would say is, of course, is that these, you know, every president, they, they're begging for it, right? They all run. They promise, you know, we're going to bring everybody together. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to stop the seas from rising. I'm going to bring peace on earth. And they never say like, you know, there's never a caveat, like assuming I can get together 60 votes in the Senate. Um, and uh, and that is a fair criticism of Obama um, that, uh, 
that he did, you know, he did make promises that he can't keep, sort of, uh, you know, political checks that he can't cash um, because there is a Republican opposition and, uh, and that's sort of the way of the world. But he did make a decision very early on that basically the way to, the way to change Washington was to uh, the, oops, excuse me, the, uh, that the only way to, to uh, you know, to change, that you couldn't change Washington, you might as well sort of change policy. Um, and, uh, and he focused on that. He focused on this inside game of passing legislation um, rather than this, uh, you know, this kind of process game of making Washington a wonderful, happy place. And I would say that it's, you know, he's going to be remembered as a very consequential president because of that. Um, he certainly will not be remembered as the president who changed the tone in Washington. But I would argue that there was really never any opportunity for him to do that, no matter, you know, how many pretty words he said about it. He's, all, he's ended up being a sort of deeds president, not a words president, which is kind of ironic since he was always seen as the guy with the, uh, you know, the sort of silver tongue and the pretty rhetoric who had never really achieved anything. Right. He, uh, I think that that's mostly right. His, uh, consequentially, you look at, let's say, the approval ratings of the White House, and he, he passed all those big things at the exact right time to pass them, right? He came into office, um, and either he or his team realized, you know, we're never going to be more popular than we are now, let's get it done, and they did. Um, and after that, it's been kind of playing defense against Republicans um, ever since then, and like you said, I think you're right, he's going to be remembered as someone who did pass uh, very, very consequential legislation, and not someone who was interested in playing the Washington inside game, you know, in 50 years, well, I'm not sure. Actually, let's say, let's say in 50 years, uh, are we going to remember Obama as someone who got, like, got things done in the mode of LBJ, even if he eschewed those personal relationships and personal politics, but was someone who did shepherd major legislation through Congress? Yeah, I really think he is. Um, and I think it was very pragmatic, especially in those first couple of years where we had Rahm Emanuel, you know, sort of, you know, who is probably as close to LBJ as we've got today, you know, up on the hill, you know, busting heads to the, to the extent he could. I do think he will be remembered for, you know, these real pivot points in, uh, in American policy um, when it comes to health care and energy and, uh, and the direction of an economy. Um, where we had a much faster recovery from a epic financial crisis than we had any right to expect. And what I think will also be interesting is the way the, the Republican opposition is, is, uh, is, is remembered. There's a kind of poignant moment in my book where, uh, where I'm talking to, I think it was, it was one of, um, it was one of McConnell's top aides. And he was talking about the kind of brilliant political strategy they had, where there was so much pressure on them to compromise. And it took some real cojones for them to say, no, we are just going to say no. We are not going to try to make this stimulus bill, you know, more to our liking. We are not going to try to push health care reforms that will uh, be stuff that we're a little bit more comfortable with. We're not going to cut a deal to improve medical malpractice reform, which is something that Obama was completely willing to do. We're not going to put in uh, more more of the kind of tax cuts that we like, which is something that Rom actually put in to try to lure their votes and then took out of the stimulus when it was clear they weren't getting them. Um, they made a decision that they were just going to be the they were just going to say no and uh, and make Obama sort of live with with what he did, and that turned out to be politically very smart. And I pointed out to him that. Yeah, but substantively, you know, Obama had achieved these kind of dreams that were, that Democrats had had for decades. And he kind of paused and he said, yeah, we regret that, <laughs> which I, uh, I think is sort of an interesting way of, of summing it up, that both uh, that Obama has sort of put the, uh, the policy first and said, we'll let the politics, you know, we'll let the chips fall where they may. And they haven't fallen all that well for them, a lot worse than, uh, than he thought, although it did get him reelected. Um, and, uh, and Republicans have said, you know what, we're just going to say no. We're not going to try to cut a deal. Um, we're going to see how that turns out politically, and we're going to put the po policy aside. And, uh, and politically, that's been a very shrewd move. Um, Policy-wise, uh, they, they regret that. All right, well, let's leave that there. Thanks a lot for coming on with me today, Mike. 
<laughs> oh, this is a pleasure, Kevin. Anytime. Sure, and uh, I will see everyone next time on another episode of Rational Actors.